I hope, like all of you, uh, you're eager to hear from Terry Irwin in the next few minutes. And it is just such a thrill for me to be able to have somebody of Terry's eminence come and chat with us about the way she's seeing transitional stages between things. I um, was trying to figure out how I could get her topic to come alive, and I was mindful of the time when our little office, Doblin, moved into a new building at 35 East Wacker, a famous building in Chicago called the Jewelers Building. On the third floor of that building was famous architect um, Helmut Jahn, trained here at IIT, directly under his mentor, who was uh, Mies van der Rohe. And uh, when we moved into the building, he had the entire third floor with 91 people on it, and we had the entire 24th floor with a small but uh, I would say eager cadre of 18 people trying to figure out a then new field called design planning. And what's interesting is that ballooning up the field for Helmut Jahn was the seven years he spent designing the Sears Tower, then the tallest building in the world. I was told that he had 18 kids working just on the reflected ceiling plans for the escape stairways in the Sears Tower for about two years, okay? So that's the way architecture used to be done. Some junior architect had to draw everything. During the time we were in that building for 13 years, Doblin grew to 42 or 43 or 44 people, and Helmut Jahn's office shrunk from 91 to about 34. And his business was five times larger. And what accounted for that, of course, was software. First AutoCAD, and then Revit, and then, um, you know, sort of Civic 3D, the new Civic architecture. And all of a sudden, instead of having junior architects hand draw all kinds of features in a building that somebody had to go build, when he would design, say, for instance, the uh, United Terminal at O'Hare, they would pick a piece of plumbing, say a urinal, and somebody would spend 11 minutes popping it into every single part of the drawing where it needed to be popped in. And what struck me about that is that that wiped out literally all of the field of apprenticing in architecture and led to this world of starchitects that we're sort of living in now that I think has sort of unintended consequences. Now, Terry's expertise is in helping us to understand how systems switch. That was a system that switched with what I would describe as no particular elegance, but an awful lot of invincibility or inevitability, right? The world is so much better when, as an architect draws a plan for a building, Everybody that needs to build the building can see the layers that they have to use to build it. And everybody that has to operate that building forever has a digital rather than a physical set of drawings to use and reuse and layer upon and add information to. Terry's job is to help us to understand the transition between an unsustainable world and a sustainable world. In my case, whenever I'm faced with really complicated things that I don't understand very well, one of the places I try to turn to is nature. And I ask, what can I learn from in nature that might help me to get a little less stupid about a problem? And one of the things that I think has helped me to understand transitions is what good biologists call edge conditions, right? So between an ocean and the land is an edge condition. It might be a reef, it might be a swamp, and the one thing you can pretty much count on is all the weirdest life forms live in those edge conditions. And so one of the things that I think is just beautiful about the expertise that Terry has developed and that students at Carnegie Mellon are lucky to, uh, to be able to uh, learn at her uh, behest is the way in which we can understand how to consciously design edge conditions, how to reduce the friction moving from our current state to a much more advanced future state 
with maybe a little bit less of the disruptions that I was describing in Helmut Jahn's office. I think it's an incredibly important topic in anything having to do with systems design, and so I'm very, very eager to have Terry teach us about it. Can we welcome her, please, ladies and gentlemen? Good afternoon. Can you, heal, can you hear me if it's down here? This is the first time I'm ever going to give a lecture with only half of my Normally, I'm somebody that's moving all around, and I'm waving my arms, and I really don't know what it's going to be like to try and give a lecture if I can't do that. So I'm going to remain sitting, and I'm going to refer to my notes heavily, but I will read them robustly. Um, I want to thank uh, the conference organizers for inviting me here today. It's just been a great conference. We, we have been lucky enough to be here since the beginning, and I've learned a lot. Um, so by way of more background, I've been a practicing designer and design educator for about 30 years, but I've been an avid student of living systems for about 20 now. I did a master's in, ho in something called holistic science at Schumacher College many years ago now, and my master's thesis looked at how principles from living systems could inform a more appropriate and sustainable design process and it's continued to inform the work that I've been doing in the area of transition design for the past few years. Um, I also want to acknowledge that um, the ideas that I'm going to talk about here today were developed in um, collaboration with Gideon Kossoff and Cameron Tonkinwise, and they've been informed for the last many years by the work of our masters and especially our doctoral students, many of you are up there today. Um, so transition design aspires to do two things. The first is develop new design-led tools and approaches that will aid transdisciplinary teams in addressing wicked problems. And two, educate new generations of designers who will be qualified to join those teams. And my lecture, oh boy, my lecture <laughs> is based upon several contentions. First, that transitioning entire societies toward more sustainable long-term futures is what the late great Thomas Berry called the great work of the 21st century. Well, he said the 20th, but that this will involve ongoing systems level change over long horizons of time, which will challenge us to develop a deep understanding of complex systems, both their anatomy and their dynamics. And this will require new mindsets and postures, as well as new knowledge and skill sets, all of which we think will give rise to new ways of designing. So very weirdly, this talk is going to begin and end with a story about wolves. This video, which some of you may have seen, is a vivid example of how sweeping change in complex open systems happens. It's called a trophic cascade, an ecological process in which change starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom, completely transforming or transitioning an entire ecosystem. This story begins in 1995 with the relatively simple step of reintroducing wolves into Yellowstone Park. Now, the park's ecosystems were in decline after decades of overgrazing by a ballooning deer population. And wolves had been absent for nearly 70 years, largely due to a long-held belief that the absence of wolves would enable other species to thrive. Now, I want to underscore this attitude toward the wolves because it illustrates how mindsets, beliefs, and attitudes are as responsible for driving change in complex systems as things like technological innovation or policy change. The contention that wolves primarily kill other species overlooks the fact that they give life to many others. Even though they were few in number when they arrived, the wolves began to have immediate, remarkable, unanticipated effects. They, of course, killed some of the deer, but much more significantly, 
they radically changed the behavior of the deer. Like beliefs and mindsets, behavior change can be a powerful leverage point for change in complex systems. Because of the threat of the wolves, the deer began to avoid certain places in the park where they could be easily trapped, particularly the valleys and the gorges. With the deer no longer overgrazing them, these areas began to regenerate, and some the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Barren valleys became forests of aspen, willow, and cottonwood, and as that happened, bird populations increased, and then the beavers returned. And the dams they built created habitats for other species, otters, ducks, fish, reptiles, and amphibians. The wolves also killed coyotes, which helped keep the deer population down. And the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, weasels, foxes, and badgers. And the bear population began to increase because there were more berries growing on regenerating shrubs. And the bears helped keep the deer population down. Ravens and bald eagles were also able to feed on the carrion that the wolves and the bears left. But all of that was not the most interesting aspect of this radical systems change. The most amazing thing was that the wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. Because of ecosystem regeneration, there was less erosion, so the rivers began to meander less. Their channels narrowed, more pools formed, and there were more riffle sections, all of which created wildlife habitats. The regenerating forest stabilized the riverbanks so they, collect, they collapsed less often and the rivers became more fixed in their course. So the wolves, though small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, but its physical geography. Now a trophic cascade is just one type of dramatic change that can occur in complex, nonlinear open systems. Another is called a phase transition, an unexpected change that basically flips the system and changes its characteristics or behavior. But most change is incremental and occurs over short or mid, long horizons of time, but at all levels of scale. But whether the change is radical or incremental, the same principles are always at work as systems change and transition. This transition in Yellowstone Park happened over the course of several decades, but some transitions take much longer. The important thing to remember is that all systems are always in transition, especially social systems always in a constant state of transition that unfolds over decades, hundreds of years, or even millennia. But these transitions are unintentional, full of drift, and we really only understand their ramifications in hindsight. We call it history. You could argue that just in the past 200 years we have transitioned, at least in the West, from industrialized societies based on large-scale, centralized mass manufacture to a more globalized, distributed networks of socio-technical systems. The problem, of course, is that these 21st century systems are transitioning toward unsustainable long-term futures. These socio-technical systems are essentially tangles of people, technology, processes, and interactions, all of which are embedded in the natural world. Basically, systems nested within systems. Social systems, infrastructure and technical systems, economic systems, and systems of politics and governance, all of which are interconnected, interdependent, intractable, and resistant to change. Socio-technical systems are also the context out of which countless interrelated wicked problems arise. Problems like poverty, racism, climate change, forced migration, a lack of access to affordable education and housing, sexism, racism, prejudice, cybercrime, and an increasingly fragile global economy, and as we all know, the list goes on and on. 
So what we have are essentially radically complex systems problems situated within radically large systems contexts. However, most problem-solving approaches do not expand the problem and context frames this way. In fact, they do just the opposite. And it looks something like this. We find or are given a solvable problem and frame it within a narrow context that focuses usually on user preferences and client profit. This is what Horst Rattel would call a tame problem. What makes them so attractive is if we frame all problems within tight, tidy frames, we can solve them every time with the approaches we already have. And we do this in the posture of the expert who says, I've seen this before, I know what to do, get out of my way and let me do it. But if we integrate social and environmental concerns into the problem frame, things begin to get gnarly. Now, if you persevere and situate that problem within its larger socio-technical systems context, you end up here, staring a wicked problem right in the eye, and you soon realize that it is connected to any number of other wicked problems. And this is about the time you will hear people say, as Horst Rattel did, this problem is simply unsolvable. So the problem-solving paralysis that can result from staring systems complexity in the eye is partly due to the fact that we don't understand systems very well, and sometimes, often, we don't even see them. And yet, socio-technical systems and wicked problems are everywhere, and their ubiquity is best explained by this old joke. Two fish bump into each other, and one says, how's the water? And the other says, what water? Marsha McLuhan, in his book, War and Peace in the Global Village, said one thing fish know nothing about is water, since they have no anti-environment which would enable them to perceive the element that they live in. Systems are so ubiquitous, and our interactions with them so pervasive, we don't really see them and therefore we don't understand them very well. But these unnoticed systems produce their own patterns of behavior over time, I'm gonna repeat that, produce their own patterns of behavior over time, become entrenched and intractable, and are therefore unintentionally directing our societal transitions toward unsustainable futures. Transition design asks whether we can develop an approach or approaches that can shift the trajectory of these systems transitions through strategically placed ecologies of interventions implemented over short, mid, and long horizons of time. Now, both wicked problems and socio-technical systems display the same anatomy and dynamics as natural living systems. They are self-organizing, meaning their response to external perturbations is self-directed. They have fractal network structures. They are not hierarchical, but rather holarchic. They display emergent properties and behavior, which basically means we can't predict how they are going to behave. And they are nonlinear, meaning the change or result is not proportionate to the input. Their elements are interconnected and interdependent, which means a change in one area ramifies unpredictably throughout. They exist at multiple levels of spatio-temporal scale and are constantly changing, learning, and evolving, and of course, transitioning. These systems are subject to sudden phase transitions, which means subtle, ongoing, almost imperceptible changes accrue in the system and can, can cause massive, sudden, unpredictable change, like we saw in the trophic cascade. Now, the argument is, if properly understood, these dynamics can be leveraged to address wicked problems and destabilize entrenched systems in order to nudge their trajectories toward more sustainable futures. 
This is really the premise of transition design. So transition design brings together two global memes. First is the idea that entire societies must transition toward more sustainable futures. And second, the realization that this will require intentional systems level change. Now, you can see evidence of these memes in the number of transition related projects and and uh, initiatives springing up around the world and the recent rise of what I will call deep systems thinking and the proliferation of knowledge, tools, and processes for understanding complex systems and systems problems. So we are bringing together tools and knowledge sets from outside the field of design that we think have the potential to inform new design-led transdisciplinary problem-solving approaches, and I want to underscore transdisciplinary. And I also want to qualify what I mean by design-led. I do not mean designers are the main experts or that they are leading or managing the problem-solving process. I mean that the tools and approaches used by designers, such as visualization, narrative and prototyping, among many, many others, can scaffold all types of transdisciplinary collaboration and help materialize ideas and concepts. These approaches also challenge us to go beyond the concept of user-centered design and human-centered design, which I will argue with anybody afterwards is inherently problematic. The tools and approaches shown here are useful in framing complex problems within radically large contexts. For example, stakeholders themselves map the wicked problems affecting them, identify how and where they disagree, then co-create visions of long-term futures in which the problem has been resolved, which enables them to transcend their differences in the present. Transition design also attempts to integrate past, present, and future into the problem frame. It looks at the historical evolution of the problem, its manifestation in the present at multiple levels of scale, and the long-term vision of the future in which the problem has been resolved. It also emphasizes the need to situate problems and solutions within the context of everyday life and lifestyles, and argues that solutions should be place-based and local yet cosmopolitan in their global awareness and exchange of information and technology, or what Ezio Manzini often calls cosmopolitan localism. Other tools and approaches are relevant to designing entire ecologies of tangible, sustainable interventions designed to destabilize entrenched systems, much like the wolves did in Yellowstone Park, which triggered a trophic cascade. All of these approaches can provide tactical ways to intervene in complex systems at multiple levels of scale. At a meta-systems level, it might involve changing social norms or reconceiving entire lifestyles to be more place-based. In contrast, social practice theory works at the most granular level of a socio-technical system to look at how individual and adjacent practices can become leverage points for change in sustainable transitions. Manfred Max Neef's theory of needs is useful for conceiving more sustainable tactical solutions and challenges the dominant socioeconomic paradigm based upon limitless growth, wants, and desires. Taken together, these and other approaches can inform interconnected synergistic systems interventions that when connected to each other and long-term visions, we hope can begin to shift the trajectory of these systems toward more sustainable futures. I'm gonna take a little bit deeper dive into just one of these tools we're experimenting with, and I'm sure there's a lot of you out there that are also familiar with this. The multi-level perspective tool, or the MLP, has been integral to the transition design approach and I thought it might have the most relevance for this audience. But first, a metaphor. 
We often say that transition design is similar to Chinese acupuncture in its approach. So acupuncturists, in order to help the body transition back into health, begin the process of placing needles in different parts of the body. And we can begin to think of each needle as a design intervention aimed at res resolving a wicked problem or destabilizing an entrenched socio-technical system. We all know that a single needle or intervention is never going to be enough to transition the system back into balance. It will take many interventions in many places in the system over a series of weeks, months, or even years to transition it back into balance. So if designers or practitioners from any discipline really begin to think in terms of ecologies of syner synergistic systems interventions instead of one-off solutions, we argue we'll have a better chance of seeding and catalyzing systems level change. However, this will require all of us to develop a deep understanding of the anatomy and dynamics of these socio-technical systems. And we need a map of their dynamics similar to the meridian map shown here. Now, that sounds pretty much impossible, I know. And yet, a group of scientists, researchers, and engineers, mostly in Northern Europe, have been doing just that for Gideon and I are arguing whether it's 20 or 25 years, maybe somebody out there knows. The Socio-Technical Transitions Research Network, or STRN, has created a sizable body of work useful to anyone who is interested in how complex open systems work. The diagram on the right is their now iconic representation of how socio-technical systems transition over time. These scholars have researched and analyzed countless historic socio-technical transitions, and they argue that if we acquire a deep understanding of these transition dynamics, then maybe, just maybe, we might be able to understand how to intentionally shift the trajectory of the unsustainable transitions we are currently in. Most of these researchers come from the disciplines of engineering, science, sociology, policy, and governance. And when we began attending conferences and contributing papers to this community, surprisingly few designers were involved. Most of the researchers were focused on governance and policy as the primary levers for catalyzing transitions, and they were relatively unaware of design and designers and certainly unaware that we are really implicated in the unsustainability of these systems. Transition design has drawn extensively on this community's work, but we have also in turn tried to convince them of the potential for design and designers to play a key role in these sustainability transitions. This is a well-known example from Dutch people, forgive me, Frank Geels that looks at the components of a socio-technical system for land-based road transportation. His research focuses on artifacts, technology, and interactions, yet design and designers are not mentioned as key players or levers in the system. I expanded on his example to try and visually represent the ways in which design actually permeates these socio-technical systems. And this visual is really just the tip of the design iceberg, as we know. You could drill down into any of these areas and encounter more and more designed artifacts, communications, environments, or scripted interactions and behaviors. Literally every facet of a socio-technical system involves design of some kind. So our argument has always been that if design is implicated in the intractability and unsustainability of these systems, then conversely, it has the potential to be a powerful leverage point for positive systems level change. But it will require designers from all sub-disciplines to become students of these systems. So I drilled 
down farther to list the designed artifacts and processes embedded within each area of this system, and then I connected it to the various sub-disciplines of design that were involved. When we presented this at the STRN conference in 2015, many researchers were quite surprised because they hadn't thought so literally about how the disciplines of design were present and implicated in these systems. One of the most important things we think these researchers have done is to identify three key systems level. The landscape, the regime, and the niche. And they argue that systems transitions are always the result of just three things. Large and small scale events, technological innovations and breakthroughs, and changes in beliefs, social norms, and practices in everyday life. Large, slow-moving events happen at the landscape level and include social, economic, political, cultural, environmental events, beliefs, and social norms. The regime level in the middle is the stuck part. It's where our societal infrastructure, laws, rules, institutions, and general ways of doing, excuse me, doing things are resi resistant to change. So the regime is comprised of networks, communities, and groups bound by norms and rules that become intractable and entrenched and, as we know, unsustainable. Just think about the rules and the norms embedded in the organizations you're part of. And we can all imagine how intractable they are, particularly in academia. The lower niche level is where new ideas are tried out under the radar and sometimes, sometimes gain traction to bubble up and fracture or destabilize that middle regime level by integrating new technologies, innovations, practices, rules, and policies, all of which can begin to nudge it into a different transition pathway. And we can refer back to we can refer back to our example of the trophic cascade to further explain these dynamics. Within the context of the MLP, the wolves could be seen as a small niche innovation or experiment. And like many experiments at this relatively uncontested level, outcomes are uncertain. And the ability to gain traction and bubble up to the regime level depends upon countless other conditions and events within the system. As we know, the experiment with the wolves did take hold and it bubbled up to the regime level. But we also have to remember that changes at the landscape level also contributed to this destabilization and that came in the form of changing attitudes about ecosystem management in general and wolves in particular. So the small experiment bubbling up from below and the large event in the form of changing attitudes from above exerted enough pressure to change the transition trajectory of the regime, which in this case was ecosystem regeneration. But let's look at an actual socio-technical systems transition, which is incredibly complex. This is one of the most often cited examples of a socio-technical transition, the one from horse-drawn carriage to automobile. And it shows the complex web of events, innovations, changes in beliefs, norms, and behavior both large and small, that led to this decades-long transition. And the point I want to make is this. These transition maps look really complicated, but they are primarily a byproduct of an extensive and important research process to understand the historic transition and connect the dots between events so you understand how the system is working. Normally, We'd never do this. Designers would never do this. To, uh, to further explain, I've highlighted just one of the shifts or destabilizations that contributed to this transition. So the establishment of electricity at the landscape level 
opened up the possibility at the niche level for an unchallenged experiment like the electric tram. And the tram's success bubbled up to the regime level and changed the infrastructure via networks of paved streets that became transport arteries. Now that led to the phenomenon back up at the landscape level of suburbanization. And we all know that that changed the way generations of people have lived their lives. Now these transition maps are more or less agnostic in so far as they simply map events, attitudes, and norms without judgment or critique. We have built on this to take a more values-based approach and try to identify wicked problems that are connected to or caused by these events and innovations. And we use the transition map as a radically large spatio-temporal context for the problem. So as an example, I've identified just a few of the wicked problems associated with suburbanization, car culture, and streets as transport arteries. So we could argue that the wicked problems of urban decline, traffic, and commuting are all associated with suburbanization. But so are the loss of natural habitat, pollution, and an increasing dependence on oil energy, and, and many others, which I did not map. So burgeoning networks of streets as transport arteries gave rise to the wicked problems of noise pollution, the decline of community and public transportation, but is also connected to the aforementioned problems of traffic, commuting, and pollution. Car, car culture, fast food, malls, and drive-in movies could be tied to the wicked problems of the decline of the high street, childhood obesity, and the decline of the nuclear family, among many others. But these problems also have connections back to oil-based energy and the decline of public transport. So you can see that embedded within this socio-technical transition is a web of complex, interrelated, wicked problems that have manifested at all levels of spatio-temporal scale. And here is where we come back to the metaphor of acupuncture and one of the primary objectives of transition design which is to ask, can we solve for multiple problems at the same time? Will having traced the historic evolution of these problems and their interconnections suggest new types of interventions or solutions? For example, is it possible to create an intervention that will simultaneously address the problems of the decline of public transportation and the decline of community? or the decline of the nuclear family, childhood obesity, and the decline of the high street at the same time. Because each of these problems are wicked in their own right, they are normally addressed by, by individually by experts within disciplinary or professional silos. Transition design asks whether the intersections or overlaps of these problems, boundary areas perhaps, opens up new opportunities for synergistic interventions that address multiple problems simultaneously. This ecology of interventions has the potential, we think, to more quickly destabilize intractable regimes, regimes and open up new transition pathways. Our master's and PhD students have used the MLP to map socio-transitions that gave rise to a number of of Pittsburgh-based wicked problems. But they have extended, in some cases, the timeline to include the long-term future visions in which the problem has been resolved. So here you see a transition map for the wicked problem of a lack of access to healthy food in Pittsburgh. This group produced a very impressive multi-level perspective map that led to a proposal for an ecology of interventions that we feel are more innovative and potentially effective than a series of separately conceived problem-specific one-off solutions. But students also map place-based wicked problems. And in our transition design seminar, they all begin mapping and looking at Pittsburgh-based wicked problems and then at some point come to the realization 
that there are interconnections and intersections among all of them. So can we again solve simultaneously for the intersections in those problems? So okay, I've gone really far down a rabbit hole here. In order to try and explain the dynamics of socio-technical systems, but now I want to zoom back up and talk very briefly about one of the emerging approaches or experiments, experiments we've been testing with both our masters and PhD students as well as a project in Ojai, California to help the community transition toward climate resiliency. And the basic approach could be broadly defined in three steps. First is to gain a shared understanding of the problem or problems among the stakeholders affected by it. Then situate the problem within a radically large spatio-temporal context. Then stakeholders co-create long-term visions of a future in which the problem has been resolved and these visions act as both magnets motivating stakeholders toward the future they want, but also serve as roadmaps for how to get there. So to begin, stakeholders map a single problem or a cluster of interrelated wicked problems. And here you see stakeholders in Ojai mapping the problems associated with climate change. And to break it down, they often work in categories of social, environmental, policy and governance, economic, technologic, technology and infrastructure issues. Now it's important to acknowledge that there are only certain kinds of things you can do in a workshop setting and we need to understand um, how to do a lot of this work via field research. However, a thorough and shared understanding of a wicked problem can only be achieved um, by getting stakeholders together and representing all voices and perspectives. So the objective of this step is to integrate all affected stakeholder perspectives into the problem definition and begin to leverage the wisdom and expertise that resides in the system. No external consultant like us is ever going to be able, no matter how long we spend there, to have the depth of wisdom that resides in the system. Integrate concerns and perspectives from both human and non-human stakeholders by appointing advocates for groups whose voices cannot be heard. And the process enables stakeholders to experience problem complexity firsthand, and they come to an important realization, and it's this. There is no single silver bullet solution to a wicked problem. Outside consultants, like many of us, realize that continuity, wisdom, and expertise must come from inside the system itself. And this therefore shifts our role from expert to being of service. In addition to problem definition, stakeholders begin to map their relationships to each other. This means explicitly identifying disagreements, feuds, oppositions, as well as areas of affinity and agreement. And this exercise enables stakeholders to explicitly name and acknowledge their differences and oppositions. And by interjecting an element of play into the process, we create a, an atmosphere of fun and permission to acknowledge these disagreements and feuds, which begins to clear the air and provides a safe place to begin to look for areas of alignment. It also provides stakeholders with an empathetic experience. They see, perhaps for the first time, other points of view about the problem and understand how it's impacting other people. And most importantly, stakeholders begin to realize that problem resolution is going to require patience, compromise, and tenacity over very long horizons of time. So once a shared understanding of both a problem and its social relations has been achieved, stakeholders co-create long-term future visions. And this visioning process enables stakeholder groups to transcend their differences in the present and collectively imagine a future that they want. 
And in comparing these visions, they often discover more areas of agreement and alignment than disagreement. And they realize that they are in general agreement about where they want to go, they just can't agree right now on how to get there. And as I mentioned earlier, these co-created long-term visions act as both a magnet pulling stakeholders toward the desired future as well as a roadmap for how to get there. So then backcasting from that future vision to the present creates what we call a transition pathway along which projects in the present and near term are situated to become steps toward that desired future or these ecologies of interventions. Here you can see a, a transition pathway exercise in which stakeholders try to imagine solutions, initiatives, and milestones involved in what will be a decades-long transition toward climate resiliency. But remember that we are really, what we're really talking about is multiple interconnected wicked problems embedded within OHI's socio-technical transitions of the past hundred years or so. And because the same systems dynamic are present in both problem and context, the approach is to find leverage points for change and connect them together to each other and the long-term vision. And it will be important to challenge our collective propensity to think that science and technology-based solutions are better or best. Certainly they will be important, but so too are new policy and economic models along with changing behavior and practices related to climate change and sustainability. Local and grassroots efforts launched from within the community itself will be crucial as well as the reconception of entire lifestyles to be more place-based. This, we think, will go hand in hand with challenging dominant cultural norms and attitudes and recapturing indigenous place-based wisdom. Most importantly, it will require these efforts to be tied to each other and the future vision. In an iterative cycle of futuring, making interventions, and then waiting to see how the system responds. Our main objective with all of this has been to start a conversation about the need for a new area of design focus aimed at systems level change and societal transitions toward more sustainable futures. No single group of people or discipline can figure this out on their own. So from the beginning, we've shared all of our thinking and research in order to invite critique and broaden the dialogue. There's an emerging group of people that are in conversation with us, both uh, folks in other design education programs, as well as an increasing number of professional design firms who are interested in finding ways to test some of these um, ideas out in the field. And finally, we developed the transition design framework as a way to bring together the transdisciplinary knowledge we thought was necessary to seed and catalyze systems level change. It consists of four mutually influencing, co-evolving areas of knowledge and skill sets. I've already mentioned several theories of change and the importance of future visioning and some of the new ways of designing that we've been experimenting with. Ironically, I did not touch on what I consider to be the most important area, which is mindset and posture. And ethics has come up a lot today, and that is absolutely where this, where this sits. Anybody interested in systems, we are in our heads a lot of the time. I love to be here. But we're not here enough of the time either. So this area we argue we need to look at ourselves and what is required for doing this important work and we think it will require postures of radical collaboration, generosity, and a more ecological worldview and values-based approach. Systems theorist Danella Meadows wrote a landmark paper called Places to Intervene in a System, 
and identified a change in mindset or worldview as the most powerful leverage point for change. Epiphanies fall into this category. And some of you may remember the late Ray Anderson, CEO of Interface Carpet, whose epiphany after reading the book Natural Capitalism led him to transition his own company towards sustainability. And that was a systems intervention that is still beginning to transition an entire industry sector. So I told you that this lecture would begin and end with a story about wolves. And this is going to be a story of one man's epiphany about wolves and ecosystems. So I want you to all get into a different headspace now and nestle down into your comfortable seats. Okay, take a deep breath. Get into a different mindset. Maybe close your eyes, and let me tell you a story. This is an excerpt from an essay by the well-known environmentalist Aldo Leopold called Thinking Like a Mountain, but most often known as The Killing of the Wolf. It begins with his reflection on what the howl of a wolf means to other species as well as humans, and this is his conclusion. Only the mountain has lived long enough to listen objectively to the howl of a wolf. My own conviction on this score dates from the day I saw a wolf die. We were eating lunch high on a rim rock at the foot of which a turbulent river elbowed its way. We saw what we thought was a doe fording the, screen, fording the torrent, her breast awash in white water. When she climbed the bank toward us and shook out her tail, we realized our error. It was a wolf. A half a dozen others, evidently grown pups, sprang from the willows and all joined in a welcoming melee of wagging tails and playful maulings. What was literally a pile of wolves rile, writhed and tumbled in the center of an open flat at the foot of our rim rock. In those days, we had never heard of the opportunity of passing up a chance to kill a wolf. In a second, we were pumping lead into the pack with, but with more excitement than accuracy. How to aim a steep downhill shot is always confusing. When our rifles were empty, the old wolf was down, and a pup was dragging a leg into impassable slide rocks. We reached the old wolf in time, to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then, and have known ever since, there, that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. Since then, I have lived to see state after state extirpate its wolves. I have watched the face of many a newly wolfless mountain and seen the south-facing slopes wrinkle with a maze of new deer trails. I've seen every edible bush and seedling browsed first to anemic desuetude and then to death. I have seen every edible tree defoliated to the height of a saddle horn. Such a mountain looks as if someone had given God new pruning shears and forbidden him all other exercise. In the end, the starved bones of the hoped-for deer herd, dead of its own too much, bleach with the bones of the dead sage or molder under the high-lined junipers. I now suspect that just as a deer herd lives in mortal fear of wolves, so does a mountain live in mortal fear of its deer, and perhaps with better cause, for while a buck pulled down by wolves can be replaced in two or three years, a range pulled down by too many deer fail replacement in as many decades. So also with cows. The cowman who cleans his range of wolves does not realize that he's taking over the wolf's job of trimming the herd to fit the range. He has not learned to think like a mountain. 
Hence, we have dust bowls and rivers washing the future into the sea. We all strive for safety, prosperity, comfort, long life, and dullness. The deer strives with his supple legs, the cowman with trap and poison, the statesman with pen, and the most of us with machines, votes, and dollars. But it all comes to the same thing, peace in our time. A measure of success in this is all well enough and perhaps is a requisite to objective thinking. But too much safety seems to yield only danger in the long run. Perhaps this is behind Thoreau's dictum, in wilderness is the salvation of the world. Perhaps this is the hidden meaning in the howl of the wolf, long known among mountains, but seldom perceived among men. That was written in 1949, 46 years before the wolves returned to Yellowstone National Park and 65 years before the implications of Leopold's essay were fully understood. So the question that I want to leave you with is this. What are the mindsets that need to change and the wolves that need to be introduced into the systems you are working to transition? Thank you. we get around systems thinking problems and the problems themselves, the temptation is to think it's just all so complicated that there's nothing that can be done. Terry just treated us to a master class in how you break a problem down into its constituent parts and pieces and you tackle them with the kind of sophistication, richness, robustness, and systemic intervention that actually has a prayer of working. I did have to tell you that after you taught us all about the salutary effects of reintroducing wolves to Yellowstone, I thought possibly we should just reintroduce them to cities. What do you think? So. Yeah, all right. So that's, Maybe so that's plan B, ladies and gentlemen. If the 10-year plan to save the planet doesn't work, we're just bringing back the wolves, bring okay? Yeah. Um, let the people fight it out. And, um, uh, but, you know, on the off chance that that doesn't work or doesn't work uh, well enough, soon enough, um, maybe you have some thoughts or questions you'd like to share with Terry. And again, if you do the honor of uh, raising your hands, we'll get the microphone moving as fast as we can. Thank you, Terry, for a very inspiring talk. Um, I'm going to try and answer your question, or at least share a thought. Um, I work as a consultant <clears throat> mostly in businesses. I go in and talk to businesses and we talk about um, the problems they're trying to solve. And most of the time, the people that come and ask us to come and look at their businesses see themselves as outside the problem. Um, and so there's a kind of fundamental question. In observing what you're talking about um, and the way you've described it, you depict a picture where people take part, they collaborate, they acknowledge that we are all actors in the system. So for me, I think, and, and it chimes in a lot when you talk about mindsets, habits, and behaviors as being major influences in how systems work. So the question to me, or the question I would throw back at you is, how can we use systemic design to change the mindsets of the leadership that sees itself as outside the problem. Um, well, you guys are going to feel like I'm copping out at every turn today. Because mostly what I'm going to say is yes, that's one of the crucial questions that we have to ask. But I think what often tends to happen is within hierarchical organizations, and I've worked in them for my entire career. Um, Stakeholder groups never come in contact with each other. You know, there's that reality show where the boss goes and works in the fast food restaurant. You know, Gideon's cousin owns a restaurant called, uh, what is it? Yeah, in, in London, and uh, Carluccio's. And they went and uh, worked in the place. And that will open your eyes. So I think some of it has to do with looking at the mindsets that have to shift within the different stakeholder groups. <coughs> I'm 
I know in, in Ojai, there are very, very diverse groups at all along a socioeconomic spectrum, and that's often really, really difficult because if you believe, like I think anybody who's a serious student of systems does, that a system's ability to adapt and be resilient is directly proportionate to its degree of diversity, uh, and we just love monocultures, we humans, um, I think that part of our job is to understand what capacity we can help build within various stakeholder groups. And I know, for instance, in Ojai, there is a Hispanic population, many of whom don't even speak English. And so it's very easy for them to be bypassed by new laws and policies, some of which might have been passed with that in mind. So there are certain capabilities that we could begin to bring to that group to help give them voice to help build a certain kind of capacity that they need, while there are other groups that probably need to understand something about implicit bias and the strength of diversity. So it's very complex, but I have worked in organizations where the mindsets at the top, had they shifted, would change more than anything else, much like Ray Anderson. But then I think as we all get trapped in these systems that can disempower us, I'm an A-type personality, you know? I'm a woman, but uh, I have pissed off a lot of people in my time because I probably should have come in a male rapper. I'd have been a lot better off. But how are we going to get people who feel disempowered to better understand the dynamics of a system so that they don't give up. It's not in my nature to do that, but I can see that I've been parts of systems in the past where I just felt that it was useless. So I think different kinds of education and empowerment needs to happen in different ways if you're going to begin to transition a system. And mostly, we are not patient, nor have we been rewarded for doing the painstaking, relatively slow foundational work that is required because time is money. And I ran a large international design firm for many years. And in fact, we worked with you once on a project, Larry, in that new building. And it is really tough to try and make a profit and keep your employees 401ks financed when time is money. So part of what has to transform is the economic model that will give people time and permission within these systems to transform, but then you go right back to the top. If the rules of the system say you have to maximize shareholder profits above and beyond anything else, then you are not going to have the time to begin to do that. So transition design, one of the things we often say is it challenges the dominant socioeconomic political paradigms. And it's going to take time to do that. So I often say to the students, the thing we all must start to do now is begin to see and understand these dynamics every single day. Every single day, I don't look at the newspaper, I don't watch a news program without trying to understand what the dynamics are in the system, and boy, have we got a good soap opera unfolding in front of us now. If you begin to look at that, um, if you can watch it without your blood pressure going off the scale, that is a perfect way to become a student of a system. But, you know, every, every job I've ever had, I failed at. You know, I just stepped down from leading a school, and we were trying to flip the system and, you know, redesign the programs and all of the curricula at the same time. And if you're not willing at least to admit to yourself where you screwed up, you also are not going to make progress. So I'm rambling all over the place, but I, I'm doing it intentionally 
to say that we are so eager to get the latest recipe, we're so eager to get the latest process and run with it. And I think all we can do in the face of this kind of complexity is begin to look at all the facets and educate ourselves because I think, I think most of you can relate to what I'm gonna say. When you first begin to learn to do something within your discipline, or you learn to play an instrument, or you're learning to be a designer, you've gotta learn the rules, and you learn the processes, and you manage, you know, you, you try to master these processes. Or if you're learning to cook, man, I can't cook at all, and I have to follow the recipe to the, to the nth degree. Once you get to a certain point, you're just riffing all the time. Everything becomes like a jazz, a piece of jazz music. You can riff all over the place. So I am really resistant to ever calling this thing a process. It's like you learn and you try and become empathetic and you try and become humble as much as you can, which kind of goes against the grain of my personality. But you have to try because that's what it takes to work inside these systems and create the permission to give, I guess, let everybody have voice. And that is a really hard thing to do. Rambled all over the place, sorry. Hi, I, I'm over here with the mic. Um, thank you very much for that talk. I found it very interesting. Um, I'm gonna ask a two-part question. Um, so you started off by saying that, you know, in some of your earlier work, you were looking at um, principles of living systems to inform sustainable design. Um, and so the first part of my question is, do you also see then, with, with that work that you were doing, do you see a way of, um, do those living systems inform how to re-embed socio-technical systems in sort of complex ecological systems? And then the second part of my question is, what, it, what do you see as sort of the interface? And so we're nudging these socio-technical systems, but then there are also these sort of macro-level earth systems that have change processes that we possibly can't nudge. And so what is the interaction effect between the two processes of change? <laughs> Excellent questions. Uh, that would take like a seminar to answer. Um, uh, they're really good questions. I'm trying to figure out how to answer you in a, in a sentence or two. Um, I'll, I'll, and my memory's not great anymore. Something like climate change, right? We don't know how far it's gone and how much we can, we can arrest it. Because, you know, David Orr, big hero of mine, good friend, always says, uh, you cannot design for human ignorance. It's part of the human condition. We can never fully understand a complex system, certainly climate change. You know, we have all these models and we have to try to model it, but we don't really know. But I think what we can be sure of is one of the biggest impediments to developing meaningful solutions right now is right here. It's changing mindsets. I mean, in a way, this country is the poster child for climate denial, right at the top. So until we begin to change the rules of the game and the mindsets and understand those are some of the most powerful levers, if, if you change, it's like Ray Anderson, had no idea how he was gonna turn a highly polluting industry and, and company to sustainability. But his mindset changed, he had an epiphany. And he said, by God, I'm gonna try because my grandkids are gonna think they should have put me in jail for doing what I'm doing. That is the most powerful piece. And again, I realize it sounds like a cop-out but how many of you in here have decided at one time or another you were just going to like significantly change your life? Like, I'm going to lose weight and I'm going to exercise. And if you managed to do it, you figured it out along the way, right? There's a great saying that goes, walker, there is no path. The path is made by walking. And so you're absolutely right. These socio-technical systems are embedded within our ecological systems. But the problem really begins with us, doesn't it? 
the wolves aren't out there making a problem. Most of the species aren't out there making a problem. And if they do, th there's usually some sort of mass die-off. So I, what was the first question? That was a, that was a big one. Ah, principal, yes. Um, well, I, there's a um, piece that I wrote about living systems principles and their relevance for design that's on my academia.edu website. It's just kind of a simple matrix. So what I did was I listed the, the living systems principle. I tried to briefly, briefly describe what it was, and then I just made some notes on what I thought the relevance for design was. But again, I, I'm always worried people take it as a recipe because it can't be. These are all principles that we need to make tacit knowledge insofar as we can. And we will figure it out or you will begin to change one thing as you go about your daily practice. And one of the things m my students often say to me is, okay, I want to do transition design. This is the work I want to do. And where's the job waiting for me in this area? And it's like, n n n no, it's not there. I mean, I just stepped down as the head of the school after 10 years, and everything I did in the area of transition design basically was done at night and on the weekends. Because I had a day job, and the day job was sustaining a paradigm that is inherently unsustainable. The art education paradigm is not sustainable. You're all paying way too much for your education. I paid too much for mine. I was nearly 50 years old before my student loans were paid off. And so we have to sow the seeds of the system's demise even as we show up and work within it every day, which is itself a transition and some of those principles will begin to help you understand the dynamics you encounter even as you sow modest seeds for its demise. I think that probably sucked as an answer, didn't it? Sorry. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question for you about mindsets around um, competition or collaboration. So um, especially when you're talking that beautiful map with the meridians and this idea of synergistic interventions that happen simultaneously. So my colleague and I are doing work around um, playing with some of the ideas that you're sharing and um, recently hosted a convening that brings people together from different parts of the system. Although unlike in natural systems, there, where there is kind of like an infinite timeline that grass and water and trees are competing for resources or spaces, in socio-technical systems, I think there are a lot of incentives for, and there's really, we're dominated by competition mindsets when resources are scarce, funding timelines are a year or two. So I'm wondering if you can speak to how to, how we can continue to, or is there something to learn, I guess, from living systems in the context of socio-technical systems as it relates to conditions for competition or collaboration? Well, it all come, it always comes back to people, doesn't it? I mean, we built them. I mean, we built the machines. And our, our um, mindsets are embedded within what they do. So it almost always comes down to changing our behaviors, changing our cultural norms. Um, and so much of, of what we do now, I think, is predicated upon this not enough mindset, a hoarding mindset. Um, hoarding money, hoarding food, hoarding land, whatever it is. And it's, and it's fear, I think, you know, we won't have enough. And I often say to the communication design students, you have a huge role to play because narrative has come up a few times in this conference. And how do we develop more powerful narratives? And I think this is where the power of vision comes in. Right now, people can't imagine a long-term future that they actually want to occupy that's radically different than what we have now. And I think that, you know, I, I so believe in this power of vision and imaginaries. You know, Dan Lockton is here from our 
our faculty, and he works in that area. And Stuart Candy is a futurist uh, that used to be with Peter, and now he's with us. <laughs> but I think that that's important. Like, can we get rigorous about imagining different futures based on enough, based upon cooperation? And how do we get around fear of other? Because that is at the root of so much of what we were talking about today. You know, we, we live in a neighborhood that's pretty diverse and probably we're afraid it's going to get gentrified. How do we overcome fear of other? Because once you start living with other, the problem more or less goes away. So if we, if the people in this room, and I think, Larry, it was you earlier today, it, that we comprise such a small percentage of the population, I mean, you've got to be kind of whacked to like be going down into systems as deeply as we are. But it's so important. And probably children get it before we teach it out of them. So how can we lead this process of imagining better long-term futures so that you can smell them, you can touch them, and you can say, well, I might not have a, a lot of money, but I'll have community. I'll have my needs met. I will have time to consider things and how do we begin to develop narratives that will show that if everyone's taken care of we'll all be better off and I don't have those answers I would say primarily what we've been engaged in is trying to figure out what the right questions are and then we're beginning to try some things out but I've said to a couple of you it's really lonely work. I mean, how many of you are in an organization where you feel like the crazy one, where nobody gets what you're doing? Yeah? So finding tribes of people that you can talk these things over with and keep each other going. And I mean, I met Gideon at Schumacher College, which was like this amazing bubble that completely changed my worldview. And that is a place we go back to all the time and finding a touchstone so you can begin to develop powerful narratives and try things out. I wish I had an easy recipe, but I don't think there is one. Yeah. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, um, please don't leave. Two, two quick things, then we get you a break, OK? One thing, as I was listening to Terry, I had a flashback to a time 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was in this meeting with one of the world's largest uh, oil companies. And Jay Doblin was there with me. And I, in my youth and exuberance and my zeal about systems thinking, I could tell that the incredibly wealthy senior executives of one of the world's largest oil companies wasn't really seeing, you know, the whole system as we thought they should. And I was getting agitated and, and, and Jay Doblin, who always knew how to read a room way better than I ever will, you know, just leaned yeah. over to me quietly and he said something which I've never forgotten to this day. It might be helpful to some of you when you get into one of these tough meetings. He said, ignorance, this monumental, this is difficult. To overcome. And I thought, you know, really, ignorance this monumental is difficult to overcome. That should, you know, maybe be our, our little touchstone whenever we get inside of a systems problem and, you know, we see that the people around us can only glimpse the bare outlines of it. But Terry, I can't thank you enough for sharing the way you've been trying to break down complicated systems and build them up. I, 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 I get to give you a book on systems thinking and structured planning. This feels a little bit like giving Jane Goodall a book on gorillas, but hey, um, maybe you can give it to someone. Thank you very much. Okay.